the burden. I have two sets of handouts today if you haven't picked one up. Okay, moving along. Uh, we had only one group left within the seedless vascular plants to look at. We are still within the Monilla phyta, but I had nothing to say about the Equisetopsida, which I will now, because uh, not only is it extremely unusual in the construction of the sporophyte, but it leads us into another topic as to the architecture of an evolution of trees later on. And as a group of surviving plants today, the Equisetopsida have definitely seen better days. And their, their day was during the Paleozoic, this late Devonian through the Carboniferous, in which they took the form of 18 meter high trees with a 45 centimeter thick trunk and they, uh, they were no um, paleobotanists have given these tree forms the uh, name of calamites. Uh, what remains of them today, we have handouts, uh, what remains of them today are now reduced basically to the shore of um, uh, have been reduced to the shore of, uh, of freshwater sources and swamps and uh, seasonally mo moist dish, uh, ditches. These are known as uh, horse tails or mare's tails or under their own name of scouring rush. The name scouring rush become, uh, is due to this extremely unusual epidermis in which you have normal cellulose walls, but in between these are chinks of silicon dioxide. So they've picked up a trick that we would normally associate with diatoms. They, have, they in fact produce this very gritty outer surface that some of you felt. And these seem to have been, for American colonists, American pioneers, the first Brillo pads. You cut them and you use them to scour pots. Um, there is a primary stem with a root, as you can see. It's horizontal again. It's a rhizome working its way through the mud. But they will produce secondary stems, which are photosynthetic. Uh, we're dealing with something that's making microfills and really shouldn't based on the production of a steel inside. More on that in a moment. But the feature of the secondary stem in the equisetums is that they seem to grow and stop and grow and stop almost like a series of orange juice cans, empty orange juice cans. Step, uh, um, stacked on, on each other. At the juncture in which one section of the secondary stem stops and another one begins, this is what we would refer to as a node because the little microfills appear at these node junctures like so forming a circle around the stem, but you've noticed in lab, a lot of them don't last. They're rather temporary and they just drop off. Uh, what should happen as we reach the tip of the stem is that we should in fact be producing a strobilus and the production of spores. This is a use for angiate system. In other species, um, sporangia emerge once again at these node junctures. You get a normal meiosis, but once again we've got something different and I sent you a, um, I sent you a video on this. Each spore is armed with four elators. We've seen these hygroscopic hairs before in the liverworts. Uh, here you have four of these attached to each 
spore and in their drying out and wetting again, they bounce along, hopefully into a moister spot where they can germinate. Uh, when we get, and some of you did the cross-sections that are in your lab book, and what we tend to find is a very different setup than what we've seen in the other seedless vascular plants. Yes, it's like a U-steel, but it doesn't do everything that we expect a U-steel to do. We have this rough epidermis. Okay, we've been through that. Then we have a, uh, a ring of tissue referred to as the cortex, and this supports a series of air ducts. Remember, these often grow right on the edge of the water. It's important that they stay buoyant. It's important to keep floating, and they these are little mini flotation devices within the cortex. When we reach the tissue called the endodermis, on the other hand, we can see the beginnings of a U-steel. That is, there isn't one central core of vascular tissue. There isn't a core as a, um, a circle of tissue with pith in the center, as in the case of a siphonosteel. We have it broken up into a series of vascular strands, and then if we have a close look at the vascular strands, we're going to see something we're going to expect to see with seed plants along the way, in that we have a phloem which faces outward, always opposite the epidermis. There will be a strand of xylem attached to it, but something different has happened here. It's not pure phloem, it's pure xylem. You have another empty pocket. This is the Carino Canal. What's happened here is that in the development of the stem, this area once had its own xylem and phloem, its baby xylem and phloem, its proto xylem and proto phloem. They get used up, they get ripped, that becomes a canal, and what you have here is the production of a second group of xylem and phloem, a metaxylem and a metaphloem in this particular case. But whatever it is, it's not good enough to form a megaphyll. So we're dealing with the uh, eusporangiate life cycle with these terminal cones or strobili. Uh, if we were to go through the life cycle, we would find that this is homosporous. Uh, the sperm has uh, quite a few uh, flagella, and um, uh, but we're dealing with a bisexual gametophyte again, as we did in the true ferns. Which takes us now into a period of evolution, if we take this and move to the blue maps in here. What I'm going to be looking at uh, uh, briefly is this period of Pangaea in which virtually all of the modern continents are wedged together. This is about two, uh, 299 to 250 million years ago. And why are we looking at them? Because it is during this period where all the continents are locked together, even before the Permian. We can go back to the Devonian, and you can see in the front, I've given you all of the uh, various eras. Don't worry about it. But it is during this period, what we would think of as the Middle Devonian, between 387 to 374 million years ago, that seedless vascular plants are the dominant trees on this planet. But it's a very strange looking forest if you check the picture in your book. You can sort of think of it as the forest of giant broomsticks or the forest of giant telephone poles. Uh, that's because while seedless vascular plants uh, at this time could produce trees 
that were over 40 meters high. It's, it's hard to believe from the Devonian through the Carboniferous. In fact, these are the major sources of what we consider coal today. There's a lot of different plant groups in coal, uh, but these are a dominant part. But what you notice when you look at the pictures is that these plants didn't branch very much. If you look at the calamites, and also we've looked at the lycophyta, well, they were huge too, and we can think of the giant lycophytes. It was sort of like looking at a at a forest of things that are tall, have a certain degree of width, may be covered with little microfills for photosynthesis. They might bump out a smaller branch, but that's about as far as it goes. We even have other systems that are grow that are that grew. Uh, pretty much the way palm trees do today, in which leaves are only produced at the top, as in the case of some of the surviving uh, fern trees on this planet. You don't have branching to the point that you see something that looks like a Christmas tree, where the branches get wider towards the base. You certainly don't see something that you see in those videos of uh, rainforests with these huge trees which are, seem to be forming giant umbrellas. You can't do that. Why can't you do that? Because based on the steels that they made, based on the cells that they made, they weren't very good at making what we think of as wood. We don't have a buildup of one group of wood cells after another forming rings. They reach a certain width, and that's it. And when you're dealing with something that's basically a big broom handle, you can't fix a large branch to it because of gravity. Eventually, it breaks and falls off. What you have to wait for, in the case of um, uh, the formation of secondary branches, are two things. The first of these in the stem is that of what we would call a vascular cambium. This is a series of let's see this is a series of, of initial cells that are producing wood over a period of time. We think of them as rings, but in tropical areas they're not making rings. It's happening sequentially, pushing phloem towards the top and leaving xylem behind. And then you have to wait for the evolution of the modern wood cell in which these xylem cells lock together by means of these specialized regions of the cell wall that snap together and you have easy movement of water through them and this is these are referred to as pit pairs which you'll see in lab the week after next but we should make a point that modern wood does not begin until we have a vascular cambium and pit pairs and this seems to be something that the seedless vascular plants didn't quite uh, uh, do with. Not to mention, the for these forests of seedless vascular plants were tied to fresh water due to the life cycle of the spore and the teeny little gametophyte. Um, these trunks grew from rhizomes uh, growing through mud, pushing their way through and then just pushing up these huge secondary stems. Uh, virtually all seedless vascular plants that grow as trees are extinct now, with the exception of some of these rather shorter uh, seed ferns that you can find in the tropics and parts of the southern hemisphere. Uh, the only seedless, the seedless vascular plants that we are most likely to see today 
do not have woody tissue inside and are growing as, as herbs. What happened? Well, if you're paying attention to the uh, eras, what we have here is that there is a worldwide drought at the end of the Carboniferous about 280 million years ago. And uh, without a consistent moist source, you can't grow a gametophyte. And these huge tree-like things simply become extinct. But that's not the only reason. Uh, also, the fossils from the Carboniferous show that there has been a rise of a new group of trees, what we would think of as progymnosperms, which will be on this other handout. Now, the progymnosperms have been moving along um, uh, for quite some time. They're, they actually start to appear at the end of the uh, Paleozoic about 300 million years ago, and they slowly became more common, forming a dominant part of the forests by the end of the Carboniferous. It's very likely that these huge seedless vascular, um, uh, the seedless vascular trees were probably also pushed out by progymnosperms because progymnosperms at this point are producing modern wood, which means, first of all, their trunk gets wider and wider over time, and secondly, they can support a whole series of secondary branches and very likely are shading out the seedless vascular plant sporophytes that are trying to come up. What we notice about the early fossils of these progymnosperms is that they have prosteels and siphonosteels. They're still making spores, but the important feature is uh, they discovered the pit pair arrangement and the vascular cambium arrangement. So they got wider and branchier. This gives them increasing, uh, increasing girth and, and solidity. And they uh, certainly um, fossilized quite well. Uh, what we then begin to find, if you check your handout, is that something new is coming on. And it comes in in time for the, uh, per the late, for the Permian drought. What we see here now is this new group of trees, which in fact uh, has evolved a device that can deal with drought very nicely. And that is, anybody? Sorry, what? Yeah, what we're seeing now is the evolution of plants with seeds, if you have uh, seen your chapter. Uh, if we look at the what's going on here, it means that everything is flip-flopped. The gametophyte no longer supports the sporophyte. The sporophyte is aiding the survival of the gametophyte. The gametophyte is parasitic on the sporophyte. It means with the production of a seed, the sporophyte can go dormant, be released by the parent into dry soil and just wait for some sort of seasonal rain, which is pretty much what seems to happen uh, these, uh, uh, these days. You see uh, from pictures in your book the uh, evolution of seeds over time. What's going on is in the case of the seed ferns, the Elkinsias, and its allies, you have a seed structure that is protected by these wisps of, uh, of tissue, what we would think of as integuments, and then you eventually go into a system in which these little integuments have fused together, 
there's going to be a pore at the top, a micro pile by which sperm can enter. And we're going to see uh, uh, on the inside of these systems, we're going to see a a mega sporangium in which you eventually form two eggs and while both may be fertilized by incoming sperm only one will develop into an embryo that will occupy the seed. This flask or this flask in which the seed develops now, this protective structure, this will eventually become the modern seed coat that we see today. Okay. If you check the opposite side here, this is a series of drawings I no normally don't present until later. Uh, one thing we see in these early seeds is the formation of what we would call cupules. That is, what we see is that the reproductive structures making twigs appear on, on the branches as a series of twigs. There is a protective, probably brightly colored pair of leaves. These are the cupules. And we find that at the base of the cupules, there will be one, sometimes depending on the species, there may be two of these undeveloped seeds. When we talk about undeveloped seeds that have not been fertilized yet with sperm and are, and are still in this virgin state, we refer to these as ovules. Each one will contain a megasporangium that is going to have at least two eggs in it. Each of these is waiting for the uh, arrival of sperm with its little fluted or low tops. So there's a hole here. That's your micropile, which means that at this point, we understand that these trees are probably on separate branches producing uh, other structures that are going to be releasing pollen. And we understand now that th this is what the whole flip-flop has been about. Pollen grains are, of course, haploid. The eggs inside of these, uh, inside of the megasporangium, are haploid. So what we have to understand then is when we deal with seed plants, pollen grains are merely male gametophytes because if you look inside, there will be at least one sperm cell, sometimes more, which in turn may be attached to another cell, more on this in the future. And inside of the megasporangium, the entire megasporangium will contain some sort of embryo sac. Sometimes it's just a couple of eggs and this is the female gametophyte. And this is what we are looking at today, and it is the dominant terrestrial plant life. This is what's producing most of the cellulose that we're seeing. But we have variation in how you make your seeds, how you arrange the anatomy inside of your seeds. 
So once again, if we flip up the, um, this particular one and go to the next page, we see that there are differences between what we would call gymnosperms and angiosperms. And furthermore, there's going to be a division within what we call angiosperms. What are we talking about? Well, you're going to be seeing them in lab this week. Gymnosperms, gymno, sperma meaning seed. Sorry, that's, it, it simply means seed. Gymnos meaning naked. In a gymnosperm, we find that both the ovule and the mature seed are exposed on a scale uh, made by the plant, and they're often shaded by some sort of broad, protected leaf known as a bract. So what we find in the case of most of the surviving gymnosperms is two ovules, each with its own little micropyle, resting on a scale And this, in turn, may have extra protection because the scale will be sitting at the base of a much bigger, protective, hard, shingle-like bract. So when you think of it, a pine cone, a pine cone is a series of bracts, each bract should be protecting a scale on which one or two of these little seeds are forming. Things are different in the angiosperms. Angio meaning either a flask or a box. This includes everything that we think of as flowering plants. Uh, what we expect to see here is very different. Instead of the seed forming exposed to the air in a gymnosperm, we expect that in flowering plants, in flowering plants, the connection between sperm and ovule is indirect. In the case of a gymnosperm, pollen grains will land on the micropyle. What usually happens is the micropyle produces a sticky drop, a pollination drop, and they're eventually sucked into the ovule where they will meet up with a uh, where, they will, where they will release their sperm and the sperm meets up with an egg. Doesn't happen here in the angiosperms. We expect that the pollen grain will land on a sticky, specially modified structure in the flower called a stigma. It produces a pollen tube in which the sperm is kept which will grow down through this neck-like structure called a style. And then it goes looking for ovules inside of this closed ovary. So we find that ovules in an angiosperm are not exposed to the air when they're ready to receive pollen. They are attached in some way to the inner wall of the ovary, usually by some stalk of placental tissue. They will also have a micropyle, but they are waiting to receive the pollen tube, which uh, will release the sperm into the embryo sac inside. Don't worry about that yet. We'll have a much closer look at the embryo sacs uh, in weeks to come. So when we consider the gymnosperms first, uh, these came in after the progymnosperms. 
they certainly differentiated. There were at least eight orders, excuse me, there were at least eight phyla of them, and five do exist today. They still exist, but not that many species compared to the angiosperms. There are variations on how they um, produce their ovules and expose their ovules. Not all of them make cones. Uh, we can think of ginkgos and yews that have different me methods of handling it. In the case of the ginkgos, it's really very simple. They just produce a spore shoot. There is a unequal pair of ovules. They're as naked as you can get. There's a little micropile at the end. They seem to be wearing these fleshy turtleneck sweaters, um, uh, regarded as a corona, and, that, and that's pretty much it. And yeah, hanging there, they do look like a pair of testicles, which tends to, which tends to explain why in Asian medicine uh, they're sort of for male problems. These, the seeds become for male problems. Uh, otherwise, in others like the U, we have the production of one ovule sitting in a very fleshy cup referred to as an arrow. This attracts birds which eat the fleshy cup and disperse the seeds. So there's variation in how gymnosperms reproduce, but not as much as we see in the, um, in the angiosperms. So gymnosperms are the oldest surviving group of seed plants after the gymnosperms. They're coming out 360 to 340 million years ago. Whereas the flowering plants and the overall term for angiosperms, people refer to them as the amphophyta, the amphophyta uh, are much later. They do not really appear. We cannot recognize them as such. It takes a while to get a fossil flower. The oldest ones are probably about 120 to 122 million years ago, which actually puts them in the Cretaceous when the various continents are separating from each other and then likewise banging into each other and setting up um, new mountain ranges like the Himalayas. Some people will argue that, well, the uh, flowering plants really probably appear at the end of the Jurassic. That's so where things are closer together and it's easier for them to move. But the fossils from that period, while they show certain angiosperm-like characters, you're still not getting the closed ovary, which is what makes an angiosperm an angiosperm. It may just be a matter of time before we find them. It's certainly a lot better that when, uh, compared to when I went off to college in, in the, in the woe-begone uh, days of, of the early 70s, in which the earliest fossils were about 65 million years ago. They seem to appear around the what we think of as the age of mammals. In fact, we now understand they're much, much older than that. Uh, but we can now say that between the gymnosperms and the angiosperms, there are at least three quarters of a million living species of seed plants on this planet. There are more seed plants than there are plants that lack seed. Uh, and the modern forests are dominated by seed plants growing as trees. The major advancement over seedless vascular plants is that the gametophyte is now dependent on the sporophyte and you don't need that wet stage in which sperm has to leave the gametophyte and go swimming around and looking for an egg. Um, this means that uh, 
uh, that seed plants are dispersing fully formed embryos in containers that are resistant to the elements, uh, but they're also packaging their seeds with a source of food. So during this dormancy period, they are respirating, but it's usually a form of anaerobic respiration. So all seed plants are technically heterosporous, producing distinct male and female gametophytes in the form of a pollen grain versus that of, a, uh, of, uh, that of an embryo sac. In regards to diversity, though, while we still have gymnosperms, 97% of all the seed plants on this planet living today are angiosperms. So if we check the other handout and simply go looking at the second page, we notice that in seeds, there are things that they t all tend to share, and then there are things that you only find in some of the seeds and not in the others. We should expect three basic components of a seed. The first of this is the coat or testa. These are mature integuments, and they are basically protective. They stop things from getting into it as the uh, embryo uh, uh, matures. And this, that's the second thing. We expect to see an embryo inside, which is, the beginning, which is what happens after you fertilize the egg. Now, you should see some food tissue also. This is a source of food and gas exchange, but this tissue can change ra uh, radically as the seed matures. In some cases, it gets gobbled up even before the seed sprouts. So if we look at seed coats, first of all, what are we talking about? We're talking about these integuments that lose water at maturation. Seeds are usually dehydrated prior to dispersal. Uh, when a seed is released by the parent plant, only 15 to 20 percent of its body weight is water. So if we look at these structures, we are going to attach this to a fruit wall. And here we have a placenta. We find that the majority of at least flowering plants will have these two basic integuments. That are going to cover the interior embryo sac. And that upon fertilization of the egg, we are going to expect that the integuments will change. Uh, they may get larger initially, they may take on certain colors, they may even get hairy or scaly at certain points, but they eventually lose water and become highly protective. But when a seed is released by the parent, we're going to find that virtually all seeds, if you look carefully enough, are going to have two rounded or um, uh, are, are going to have two rounded um, scars on them. The first of these, which is the largest and easiest to see is referred to as the hilum. This is where the seed was attached. 
by means of placental tissue. In fact, some seeds take the placental placenta with them. The placenta ripens along with it. And you can see some of these little seeds with a fleshy structure, often colorful and smelling quite nicely, attached to the seed. Uh, the hilum, in this case, often fills with amino acids and lipids and triglycerides and becomes very attractive to certain animals which take the seed away, eat the hilum, and leave it, the seed, somewhere to germinate. Ants are particularly interested in seeds that have a fleshy um, placenta. A fleshy placenta can be called a caruncle. And since ants can be very messy housekeepers, this is great for the seeds because the, uh, the seeds, once the caruncle is removed, go into the ant's garbage pit and that is where they sprout. But there is another structure here, a small pore, which is what? You get two scars. One's big, that's the hilum, that's placenta, and the other one is what? The other one, this other pore, that's the microfile. That's all that's left of it. Now think of it. Comparatively speaking, when you think of it, a hilum, which was formerly attached to a placenta in an ovary, is comparable to our own belly buttons. But there's one thing animals don't have. We don't carry around the uh, pore by which our father's sperm entered into, our, uh, into the egg. Now, do we? So, um, let's move on. Yeah, I think we need to have a little break first, and I'll put a few things up. And those of you who didn't pick up the handouts might, might be a good time to do so.
anyone had a chance to sign the um, people are still at it. We'll move along then. We've had a look at the seed coat. Let's look at the embryo. Embryos of plants, mature seed embryos of plants, should be composed of three parts. There should be, a, a, um, there should be three parts. Some get by uh, with only two. But an embryo should consist of an epicotyl and a, a hypocotyl. The epicotyl is the shoot. The epicotyl is what will eventually escape and produce uh, stems and leaves. So we expect that the epicotyl will be covered, it will be clasped by these tiny microscopic leaves known as plumules. They will eventually expand into the first true foliage leaves. At the bottom, we should see a hypocotyl. This, of course, is the embryonic root. It usually has a swollen tip, referred to as the radical, and then we, should, we would expect, even at this early age, it is covered by a series of dead cells known as the root cap. You can think of it coming out pushing itself into the soil, and of course you need some sort of a helmet, some sort of a protective device, so that it isn't ripped to shreds. Because we're going to find that in both, we're going to find in both epicotyls and hypocotyls, there will be centers of mitosis that we refer to as meristems. More on this later, and it's important to realize at this stage they are both primary meristems inside, producing primary growth, which means you uh, length is more important than width. Now the next feature is where we first see a number of these seeds diverging, and that is cotyledons. Cotyledons are embryonic, leaf-like structures that often have a variety of jobs, and most of the ones that you're going to see on Wednesday and Thursday, their primary job is early photosynthesis. They get the seedling done, make some sugar, before the plumules have a chance to really take over. But you'll see that there are a great deal of differences between the, um, first of all, gymnosperms and angiosperms. Gymnosperms tend to produce quite a few cotyledons. They can produce as many as eight. Whereas if we take the flowering plants and subdivide them into monocotyledons and eudicotyledons, these are the major classes within the, uh, within the phylum Anthophyta, we see that monocots usually produce only one cotyledon, and very often it's not photosynthetic. It serves as sort of a stomach. It is actually serving as a digestive organ that is going to help break down the stored food it's not always photosynthetic. Whereas in the eudicotyledons, we expect that they are going to produce two cotyledons, each one flanking the epicotyl, as you can see. The function and shape of cotyledons, as I said, tends to differ between monocots and eudicots. In the eudicots, the cotyledons are usually photosynthetic. They will make food. They may even contain food. When you think about it, every time you eat a bean or a pea, most of the nourishment is from the cotyledons. They've already absorbed the stored food during the maturation process. So cotyledons may vary in thickness in eudicotyledons. 
when they are thin and flexible, it usually means that there's lots of stored food in the in the seed in the form of what we would call endosperm. More on that in a moment. When they are thick, succulent, and hard, we expect that they've already digested the endosperm and they're in fact containing it within the cotyledons. And I said in monocots we expect that the cotyledons are not photosynthetic at all. They're acting as a stomach uh, accumulating and transferring endosperm sugars as they are broken down during the act of germination. That is, the food uh, is broken down by enzymes during the act of, of germination. In some grasses, and all grasses are monocots, uh, the cotyledons never leave the interior of the hard seed. They just become, they're just a hard little stomach as the um, as the epicotyl and hypocotyl break out of the seed. Um, they're rather hard and stony, and when you pop corn, that little brown scab in the center of a popcorn is in fact the, um, the single cotyledon, and it's referred to as a scutellum. Looking then at food tissues, they are going to differ cytogenetically in seed plants. In gymnosperms, the food tissue, as you can see, is provided exclusively by the female parent following meiosis. So in gymnosperms, food tissue is always haploid. This means it develops much more slowly than the embryo would. And one of the reasons it takes so long for gymnosperms to mature, frequently just getting them out of the seed, is because the cone will hang on the parent slowly picking up uh, food into its haploid tissue from anywhere from, from, from a year to, to 18 months. It's that slow a process. Angiosperms, on the other hand, have this amazing endosperm, which in fact is triploid. I will have more to say about this in weeks to come. But if we look at most embryo sacs, here is your egg. In the center of the embryo sac, we normally see these two cells mushed together. They're haploid, but they're compressed together, and these are known as the polar cells. It means that when a pollen tube delivers its sperm. It's not delivering one sperm to an embryo sac in an amphiphyte. It's delivering two. One will unite with the egg, and this gives you the diploid embryo, but one actually unites with the polars, and this gives you a triploid endosperm. Triploid mitosis is fast, development is fast. We find that in the angiosperms, uh, the formation of an endosperm is often accomplished in a period of just a couple of weeks. This means that the endosperm inside of an angiosperm seed is going to develop as rapidly as that of the embryo. Now, in some angiosperms, endosperm never forms. The seeds are photosynthetic and are ready to photosynthesize uh, before they germinate. 
as in the case of rhododendron seeds. We see the seeds of rhododendron. They have a transparent seed coat, and they have little green embryos inside, and they're all, they're all ready to go almost as soon as they hit the, for, the uh, forest floor. And then you get others like the case of the orchids, which I've already mentioned, of which there's more than 20,000 species. Virtually all of them do not produce endosperm, but they have to go very quickly. Uh, once they fall to the, uh, to the ground, they have to very quickly join up with a fungus that makes endomycorrhiza. When you think about it, it's the fungus that is feeding the orchid uh, often for a period of several years until they develop their first leaves. Um, if we look at embryonic development in seed plants after fertilization, the zygote starts dividing and enters what we would call a proembryonic phase. Here, once again, this is an early period of development, and it is pretty much identical in monocots as well as in eudicots, which we will concentrate on at the present time. What should we expect in the early development of a seed embryo? What makes something a pro-embryo? What we should expect to see here is that it will consist of two parts. You're thinking of something developing inside of this ovule at this point. We should expect to see, first of all, something that looks like a chain ending in a big fat basal cell. This chain is called the suspensor. The second part of this will be the proembryo, a multicellular proembryo. which will develop into the full embryo that I've talked about with an epicotyl and a hypocotyl. But at this point, there is a distinction between monocots and eudicots. In the eudicots, we expect the proembryo will develop into a little heart-shaped structure. The two lobes here will become the cotyledons. We have a little epicotyl here, and the bottom half will become the hypocotyl. In monocots, on the other hand, the proembryo simply gets longer and more torpedo-shaped. At most, what you get on one side is the formation of a little notch, which you can see. So the top part is your, cotyl your single cotyledon. Here is your epicotyl, and here is your hypocotyl still attached to its suspensor, and you'll be able to see the difference in lab this week. What you do with the, with the suspensor uh, also seems to show a difference between monocots and eudicots. In angiosperms, the suspensor may make proteins for rapid growth of the proembryo. and or the suspensor acts as a pipe or conduit so that the proembryo absorbs nutrients from the developing endosperm. 
Not in gymnosperms. In gymnosperms, the suspensor does nothing more than push the proembryo into the haploid nutritive tissue. Now, this is why the seeds of some eudicots lack endosperm and have these big, lumpy, hard, fleshy uh, cotyledons. What's happened then in the case of some of the eudicots is that the basal cell has hooked them up to the triploid endosperm and the nutrients in the endosperm goes into building the proembryo, which means you tend to produce these embryos with these absolutely huge fleshy cotyledons. And if you don't believe me, the next time you have guacamole, save the seed, let it germinate. When the little epicotyl comes out, you can open it and you can see that those are just two big cotyledons that have been feeding the little um, uh, epicotyl. Which takes us then into this matter of dormancy and germination. The embryo of a seed is mature once it forms all its organs and crushes the suspensor. When this occurs, one of two things can happen. In a few cases, the embryonic root or radical continues to grow until it breaks through the seed wall. The seed is released from its parent and it grows independently immediately. This is a relatively rare occurrence. When you think of what's going on here, the seed is still attached to the parent. It may even have a little bit of a fruit wall around it. And it's producing a little dagger-like hypocotyl, and then breaks off of the parent and probably will fall will uh, will, and probably will fall into soft sand or mud. A number of trees that live in estuary areas in the tropics or in Florida that we think of as mangroves do this. It's a way of pre-planting your seed in an area that has a tide going in and out. You can't afford to wait. You got to get the thing uh, established in the mud flat or it's going to be carried out to sea, right? We also have this group of, of marine plants in tidal areas known as seed grasses, and they're taking it even more seriously. Once the hypocotyl comes out, the hypocotyl starts branching into these little claw-like structures that allow the seed to grasp the sandy bottom. But this is rare. Most seeds are not ready for germination as soon as they mature. In most plants, the seed will then lose again between 15 to 20 percent of its body weight in water and it enters a period of arrested development we call dormancy. In dormancy, the life of the seed hasn't stopped, it's just entered a slower phase. Why? The seeds of many plants require a slow dormant phase to achieve enzymatic maturity, what we would call after ripening. This explains why in the fall some people pick fruits off of a tree, clean off the fruit flesh, stick them in a pot, and say, oh, I have a little tree growing on my windowsill in the overwinter. I'll get to give it a head start, and nothing happens. For a number of our trees here in autumn, what they require is a period of after ripening. Their seeds are anatomically correct, they have all the parts, but they haven't started making certain enzymes yet. For that, they need a moist, low temperature for a period of weeks. So that's why they only start sprouting in the spring. 
Dormancy also, the second feature, is dormancy gets the seed through bad times. The seed stays in the slow phase until environmental conditions ensure peak survival. Consequently, there's a tremendous difference between the act of germination in a rainforest versus a desert. Trees in a rainforest drop their seed, or the seed is eaten by an animal and pooped out. They land on a wet surface soil and they immediately start growing. There is really not much in the way of a dormancy period. In deserts, on the other hand, where rain is, um, is shall we say, infrequent or then highly seasonal, seeds can stay there for a period of years. In fact, these seeds in their coats have these tannin molecules which are anti-germinants. They're not waiting for just some moisture, they're waiting to be thoroughly soaked. They're waiting for puddles to form. At that point the anti-germinants leach out. It means the, sto the soil will stay wet for a period of weeks and that is only when these seeds begin to, uh, to germinate. Dormancy is halted by up to four environmental factors. In order of importance, they are water, oxygen, remember we have to go from an anaerobic to an aerobic state, temperature, and then in rather rare cases, light. Most seeds, as we know, at least most of our crops that we depend on, most seeds break dormancy following rehydration. Water enters through the micropile or the hilum, or you have some seeds that just have a very porous or loose seed coat. What should happen then is that with water entering, the embryo tissues rehydrate, they swell, and then the seed coat ruptures or fragments. A lot of seeds have got this all built in, all taken care of. If you look at them, as you will in lab, we see that there are pre-made sutures on the seed coat. These are weak points and as the cotyledons in particular fill up with water and start pushing outward, the seed coat splits naturally along these pre-existing sutures. In other cases, for example, like lima beans, as the cotyledons get bigger, the seed coat just fragments into a bunch of little scales and falls off. Once this occurs, of course, once the seed coat has ruptured, uh, you have an invasion of oxygen to the embryo. So cellular respiration changes from anaerobic to aerobic. But there is this non-germination that can occur. People are just banging their heads against the wall. I can't get the seed to germinate. That's because other environmental pressures may control rates of germination. We've already looked at this matter of after ripening in which the embryo is structurally complete but enzymatically immature. This is where, this is where as I said, temperatures become important, particularly low temperatures. We tend to associate this with plants that drop their seeds in the fall and do not allow germination until warming conditions in the spring. Other seeds have impermeable coats. That's the end of that. There's no porosity, not even through the hilum or the micropile. You require other forces to break through. This can be a case of slow erosion or mechanical cracking. In certain cases with alpine plants, you need a freezing period, freezing um, freeze, defrost, freeze, defrost, acting on the uh, seed coat. A large number of animals 
will have an effect on certain seed coats, birds with gizzards wind, uh, uh, grinding it down, certain stomach acids, certain seeds must pass through the body of an animal before they are likely to germinate. Um, and even fire in certain parts of the world. There are cyclical fires. We can think of certain floras in certain parts of the world, like um, the chaparral around Los Angeles as a flammable flora or in certain parts of South Africa at the Cape of Good Hope and a lot of Australia. Um, these are cyclical fires that blister the seed coat which then pops and then only then will water get to it. And it can be very dramatic. The seeds in these flammable floras wind up getting covered by debris year after year, twigs and leaves full of essential oils. A fire goes through, they are insulated a bit, but this burns away, the seed gets charred, and it pops. And I've already mentioned the case of anti-germinants in various um, seed coats, particularly in desert flora. This is usually a buildup of tannins which have to be leached out. Um, with germination, when we're talking about the embryo escaping from the seed coat, there's up to about nine phases of what's going to go on, but we will save that for Thursday. Could I have the sign in when you're finished with it? Sign in, please. Who's got it? Oh. Sign in.